Hello and welcome to our second annual Night of the Living Dead Halloween special presented by Jimmy Jams alongside the Rothless Clucker, Derek Hart. I'm Landon Evanson bringing you your monthly dose of Velveeta. And a year after bringing you horror icon Kane Hodder for All Hallows' Eve, we follow him up with another. Sid Haig, otherwise known as Captain Spaulding, is our B-Movie Banter guest for our third segment, so be sure to stick for that unless that's not good enough for you. What's the matter? Don't you like clowns? Don't they make you laugh? Aren't they... Hey, whoa, 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 whoa. You're right, enough of the jackassy questions. All right, Colonel, for anyone who hasn't seen George A. Romero's zombie classic, what to expect from night? I mean, it might not seem scary in comparison to the stuff we have on the big screen today, but uh, you got to give credit where credit's due. I mean, when I was watching this, I kept thinking to myself, how did they get away with that amount of gore back then? Yeah. I mean, some of it even made you turn away, which, yeah. you know. Uh, and not that this movie isn't perfect. I mean... The way it's praised, it sounds that way, but uh, one of the main characters seems to be in a catatonic <laughs> state yeah. the entire time, and she's really frustrating in this movie. I mean, give her a cup of coffee or a <laughs> shot of something. I mean, really, she just needs to get off the damn couch and move. Uh, sometimes she reminds me of the, uh, the scene in Tarantino's uh, Kill Bill. <laughs> Come on, move your big toe. <laughs> And lastly, this, uh, this movie kickstarted an entire movie genre, so you know it has to be good. It's just a classic. Right, you are. Zombies as we know them today were born from this flick. And for any of you wondering if this Yankees cap is my idea of a Halloween costume, it's not. This is a shining example of why you should never make fantasy football bets when you're matched up with a friend who has Jamal Charles and Des Bryant and Golden Tate decides to go off for 41 points because this is what happens when you're that guy. I don't have an excuse. <laughs> <laughs> right. That brings us to the Joe Bob Cephas B-movie totals. We have 18 dead bodies, four Molotov cocktails, five punches thrown, one explosion, one botched getaway, multiple shots to the head with a tire iron foo, trowel wielding foo. Here's Johnny. It's 1968's Night of the Living Dead. It gets four stars. Roll it. Enjoy the late, great Dwayne Jones' as banner. Remember three things. Our B-movie banter interview with Sid Haig in our third segment. You'll have a chance to win a B-movie winter hat in our next segment. And that the Reader's Digest once wrote that if watched, Night of Living Dead would inspire cannibalism. So grab a fork and a bib, you little lectors, and dig in. They ought to make the day the time changes, the first day of summer. What? Well, it's 8 o'clock and it's still light. A lot of good the extra daylight does us. Now, we've still got a three-hour drive back. We're not going to be home until after midnight. Well, if it really bugged you, Johnny, you wouldn't do it. 
You think I want to blow Sunday on a scene like this? You know, I figure we're either going to have to move Mother out here or move the grave into Pittsburgh. She can't make a trip like this. Oh, I know that she can't. Is there any of that candy left? No. Look at this thing. We still remember. I don't. You know, I don't even remember what the man looks like. Johnny, it takes you five minutes. Yeah, five minutes to put the wreath on the grave and six hours to drive back and forth. Mm -hmm. Mother wants to remember, so we trot 200 miles into the country and she stays at home. Well, we're here, John, all right? Back on. Oh. Uh, ladies and hey, gentlemen, good. we're coming back on the air after an interruption due to technical problems. <laughs> Nothing wrong with the radio. Must have been the station. Which row is it in? sleep on the time change. I think you complain just to hear yourself talk. There it is. I wonder what happened to the one from last year. Each year we spend good money on these things. We come out here, and the one from last year's gone. Well, the flowers die, and the caretaker or somebody takes them away. Yeah, a little spit and polish, you can clean this up. Sell it next year. Wonder how many times we bought the same one. Come on, Barb. Church was this morning, huh? Hey, I mean, praying's for church, huh? Come on. I haven't seen you in church lately. <laughs> well... Not much sense in my going to church. Do you remember one time when we were small, we were out here? It was from right over there. I jumped out at you from behind the tree, and Grandpa got all excited, and he shook his fist at me, and he said, Boy, you be damned to hell. <laughs> remember that? Right over there. Well, you used to really be scared here. Johnny. Well, you're still afraid. Stop it now. I mean it. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Stop it. You're ignorant. They're coming for you, Barbara. Stop it. You're acting like a child. Look, they're coming for you. Look, there comes one of them now. He'll hear you. Here he comes now. I'm getting out of here. Johnny.
All right. Don't worry about him. I can handle him. Probably be a lot more of them as soon as they find out about us. The truck is out of gas. This pump out here is locked. Is there a key? We can try to get out of here if we can get some gas. Is there a key? Suppose you've tried this. Do you live here? Take some food. I'll see if I can find some food. Have you seen any more around here? I can I take care of those know. two. I but don't I know, know you're afraid, but we have I to... don't know! I don't know! What's happening? Oh. Oh, my God. 
know we're in here now. Don't look at it. find some wood, some boards, something about the fireplace, something we can nail this place up. Look, I know you're afraid. I'm afraid too. But we have to try to board the house up together. Now, I'm going to board up the windows and the doors. Do you understand? We'll be all right here. We'll be all right here until someone comes to rescue us. But we'll have to work together. You'll have to help me. Now, I want you to go in and get some wood so I can board the place up. Do you understand? Okay? Okay?
next row. Yeah, I'll let you pick out some nails. Pick out the biggest ones you can find. All right, it's time for the Excel Images portion of the program. Excel Images, providing creative solutions to excel your image, your business, your event, your team. This month's product features this lovely retro vintage mason jar. It comes in the sea glass color you see here along with a stainless steel lid, and it's built with a double wall acrylic material, which helps your beverage of choice cool and condensation free for all your movie and football viewing pleasure. It's BPA free, holds 20 ounces, and of course, add your logo to it, and you get yourself a one-of-a-kind mug. Just reach out to the good folks over at Excel Images by dialing 507-454-2000 for details. With that said, we offer up the Excel Images caption contest for October. Just offer up your caption for the image you see on the screen, and you could be the lucky winner of this B-Movie Winter hat. I've been rocking one of these on the chilly days we've had of late here, and I can tell you, wind does not penetrate this lid. It will get the job done in keeping your cranium toasty with the cold and snow to come. Red, black, blue, or green, winner's choice. Just send that caption to either bmovie at hbci.com or drop it at facebook.com slash hbc.bmovie or twitter hbc underscore bmovie to be entered. Whoever makes us laugh hardest gets the prize, so come strong. All right, we're about to embark on the second segment of Night of the Living Dead. What have we learned so far? There are zombies lurking about, and we're not sure why. Dwayne Jones' as Ben is resourceful and can think on his feet, but Judith O'Day's Barbara isn't exactly an asset, is she? Ben asks her for whatever wood she can find around the house to help batten down the hatches, and she brings back some kindling. I mean, not to mention, Ben takes the time to dismantle the table screw by screw <laughs> instead of smashing it to pieces. I mean, that would have saved him so much time right there. And we also discover that the uh, previous owner of the house broke a pretty big rule involving gun storage. You never keep the bullets in the same place as the gun. I mean, what happens if somebody breaks in your house and finds it? Uh, well, I guess we kind of find out in this segment. And uh, lastly, prepare yourself for a happy Gilmore moment as uh, Ben reminds us that you will go to sleep or I will put you to sleep. What a fabulous looking trophy. Yeah, this room looks pretty secure. If we have to, we can run in here and board up the doors. Won't be long for those things be back pounding their way in here. They're afraid now. They're afraid of fire. I found that out. You know a place back down the road called Beatman's? Beatman's Diner? Anyhow, that's where I found that truck I have out there. There's a radio in the truck. I had jumped in to listen to it. When a big gasoline truck came screaming right across the road. With it must have been 10, 15 of those things chasing after it grabbing and holding on. Now, I didn't see them at first. I could just see that the truck was moving in a funny way. And those things were catching up to it. The truck went right across the road. Slammed on my... I guess the driver must have cut off the road into that gas station by Beekman's Diner. It went right through the billboard, ripped over a gas pump, and never stopped moving. By now, it's like a moving bonfire. Didn't know if the truck was going to explode or what. Still hear the man screaming. This thing is just backing away from it. I looked back at the diner to see if, if there was anyone there who could help me. That was when I noticed that the entire place had been encircled. There wasn't a sign of light left except... By now there were no more screams. 
realized that I was alone with 50 or 60 of those things just standing there staring at me. I, I started to drive. I just plowed right through them. They didn't move. They didn't run or just stood there staring at me. Just wanted to crush them. They scattered through the air like bugs. We were riding in the cemetery. Johnny and me. Johnny. We, we came to put a wreath on my father's grave. Johnny and, and he said, can I have some candy, Barbara? And we didn't have any. And, oh. Near. Hot. Uh. And, and he said, oh, it's late. Why did we start so late? And I said, Johnny, if you'd gotten up earlier, we wouldn't be late. Johnny asked me if I were afraid. And I said, I'm not afraid, Johnny. And then this man started walking up the road. He came slowly, and Johnny kept teasing me and saying, he's coming to get you, Barbara. And I laughed at him and said, Johnny, stop it. And then Johnny ran away. And I, I went up to this man, and I was going to apologize. Why don't you just keep calm? And I looked up. And I said, could he? And he grabbed me. He grabbed me. And he ripped at me. He held me and he ripped at my clothes. I think you should just calm down. Oh, oh I screamed, Johnny! Johnny, help me! Oh, help me! And he wouldn't let me go. He ripped at me. And then Johnny came and he ran and he had, he fought this man. And I got so afraid, I ran, I ran, I ran. And Johnny didn't come. We've got, to, we have to wait for Johnny. We better go out and get him. We have to go out and get Johnny. He's out there. Please, don't you hear me? We've got to go out and get him. Please! We have got to go get Johnny! Please help me! Please! Don't you know what's going on out there? This is no Sunday school picnic. Don't you understand? My brother is alone! Your brother is dead. No! My brother is not dead! Because of the obvious threat to untold numbers of citizens, and because of the crisis which is even now developing, this radio station will remain on the air, day and night. 
This station and hundreds of other radio and TV stations throughout this part of the country are pooling their resources through an emergency network hookup to keep you informed of all developments. At this hour, we repeat, these are the facts as we know them. There is an epidemic of mass murder being committed by a virtual army of unidentified assassins. The murders are taking place in villages, cities, rural homes, and suburbs with no apparent pattern or reason for the slayings. It seems to be a sudden, general explosion of mass homicide. We have some descriptions of the assassins. Eyewitnesses say they are ordinary-looking people. Some say they appear to be in a kind of trance. Others describe them as being... So, at this point, there is no really authentic way for us to say who or what to look for and guard yourself against. Misshapen monsters. Reaction of law enforcement officials is one of complete bewilderment at this hour. So far, we have been unable to determine that any kind of organized investigation is yet underway. Police, sheriff deputies, and emergency ambulances are literally deluged with calls for help. The scene can best be described as mayhem. Mayors of Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, and Miami, along with the governors of several eastern and midwestern states, have indicated the National Guard may be mobilized at any moment, but that has not happened as yet. The only advice our reporters have been able to get from official sources is for private citizens to stay in their homes behind locked doors. Do not venture outside for any reason until the nature of this crisis has been determined and until we can advise what course of action to take. Keep listening to radio and TV for any special instructions as this crisis develops further. Thousands of office and factory workers are being urged to stay at their places of employment, not to make any attempt to get to their homes. However, in spite of this urging and warning, streets and highways are packed with frantic people trying to reach their families or apparently to flee just anywhere. To repeat, the safest course of action at this time is simply to stay where you are. in our new Latest word also from National Press Services in Washington, D.C., now tells us that the emergency presidential conference, which we've just mentioned, will include high-ranking scientists from the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. That's the extent of this latest their facilities in an emergency network to bring you this news as it develops. We urge you to stay tuned to radio and TV and to stay indoors at all costs. Late reports reaching this newsroom tell of frightened people seeking refuge in churches, schools, and government buildings demanding shelter and protection from the wholesale murder which apparently is engulfing much of the nation. Law enforcement officials are at a loss to explain or even at this hour, even to theorize about the reasons for this wave of murder.
southeastern portion of Texas. Similar killings have been reported around the Houston and Galveston areas, but nothing like that. I found a gun and some bullets out there. It was only late yesterday oh, when these. it became clear we were facing some kind of national emergency. When first reports began filtering in, newsmen and law enforcement agencies were of the opinion... This place is boarded up pretty solid now. In nature. However, as these we ought to be all right here for a while. Dramatically, it was soon apparent that we have a gun and bullets, food and the radio. Sooner or later, someone bound to come and get us out. Creatures from outer space. So again, we join with law enforcement agencies urging you to seek shelter in a building. Lock the doors and windows securely. Hey, that's us. We're doing all right. Cautious of any suspicious strangers. And keep tuned to your radio and television for survival instructions and further details of this continuing story. Look, I don't know if you're hearing me, but I'm going upstairs now. If anything should try to break in here, I can hear it from up there. I'll be down to take care of it. Everything is all right for now. I'll be back to reinforce the windows and doors later. But you'll be all right for now, okay? Okay. Civil defense officials in Cumberland have told newsmen that murder victims show evidence of having been partially devoured by their murderers. from witnesses to the effect that people who acted as though they were in a kind of trance were killing and eating their victims prompted authorities to examine the bodies of some of the victims. Medical authorities in Cumberland have concluded that in all cases, the killers are eating the flesh of the people they murdered. Repeating this latest bulletin just received moments ago from Cumberland, Maryland, civil defense authorities have told newsmen that murder victims show evidence of having been partially devoured by their murderers. Medical examination of victims' bodies shows conclusively that the killers are eating the flesh of the people they kill. And so this incredible story becomes more ghastly with each report. It's difficult to imagine such a thing actually happening, but these are the reports we have been receiving and passing on to you, reports which have been verified as completely as is possible in this confused situation. It is happening, and it would appear that no one is safe from this wave of mass murder. We're from town. City. A radio. County, Pennsylvania. The Butler County Sheriff has verified that reports of murder being partially eaten by their slayers is true. No further details available at this time. However, my well, you guys been down there. I could use some help up here. That's the cellar. It's the safest place. You mean you didn't hear the racket we were making up here? How were we supposed to know what was going on? There have been those things for all we knew. That girl was screaming. Sure, you must know what a girl screaming sounds like. Those things don't make any noise. Anybody would know somebody ever needed help. Look, it's kind of hard to hear what's going on from down there. We thought we could hear screams, but for all we knew, that could have meant those things were in the house afterwards. And you wouldn't come up and help? Well, if there were more, the racket sounded like the place was being ripped apart. How were we supposed to know what was going on? Now, wait a minute. You just got finished saying you couldn't hear from down there. Now you say it's not like the place was being ripped apart. It would be nice if you get your story straight, man. All right, now you tell me. I'm not going to take that kind of a chance when we got a safe place. We luck into a safe place, and you're telling us we got to risk our lives just because somebody might need help, huh? Yeah, something like that. All right, why don't we settle this, oh, mister? We came up. Okay, we're here. Now I suggest we all go back downstairs before any of those things find out we're in here. They can't get in here. You got the whole place boarded up? Yeah, most of it. I'll be a few spots upstairs. They won't be hard to fix. You're insane. The cellar's the safest place. I'm telling you, they can't get in here. And I'm telling you, those things turned over our car. We were damn lucky to get away at all. Now you tell me those, those things can't get through this lousy pile of wood? 
His wife and kids down the stairs. The kids hurt. Well, I still think we're better off up here. We could strengthen everything up, Mr. Cooper. With all of us working, we could fix this place up in no time. We have everything we need up here. We can take all that stuff downstairs with us. Man, you're really crazy, you know that? You've got a million windows up here. All these windows, you're gonna, you're gonna make them strong enough to keep these things out, huh? I told you, those things don't have any strength. I smashed three of them and pushed another one out the door. Did you hear me when I told you they turned over our car? Oh, hell, any good five men can do that. That's my point. Only there's not going to be five or even ten. There's going to be twenty, thirty, maybe a hundred of those things. And as soon as they know we're here, this place is going to be crawling with them. Well, if they're that many, they'll probably get us wherever we are. <sighs> Look, the cellar. The cellar, there's only one door, right? Just one door, that's all we have to protect. Tom and I fix it so it locks and boards from the inside. But up here, all these windows, why, we'd never know where they were going to hit us next. You got a point, Mr. Cooper. But down in the cellar, there's no place to run to. I mean, if they did get in, there'd be no back exit. We'd be done for. Uh, we can get out of here if we have to. And we got windows to see what's going on outside. But down there, with no windows, if a rescue party did come, we wouldn't even know it. But the cellar is the strongest place. The cellar is a death trap. I don't know, Mr. Cooper. I think he's right. You know how many's out there? I don't know. I figure maybe six or seven. Look, you two can do whatever you like. I'm going back down to the cellar, and you better decide. Because I'm going to board up that door, and I'm not going to unlock it again, no matter what happens. Now, wait a minute, Mr. Cooper. No, I'm not going to wait. I've made my decision, now you make yours. Now, wait a minute. Let's think about this. We can make it to the cellar if we have to. And if we do decide to stay down there, we'll need some things from up here. So let's at least consider this a while. If you box yourself in the cellar and those things get in the house, you've had it. At least up here you have a fighting chance. Yeah, it looks like about eight or ten out there now. There's more than there were. There are a lot out back, too. He's insane. We've, we've got to have food down there. We've got a right. This is your house. We've got a right. You going down there with him? W well, uh, yes or no, this is your last chance. No beating around the bush. L l listen, I got a kid down there. She, she can't possibly, I couldn't bring her up here. She can't possibly take all the racket and those, those things smashing through the windows. Well, you're her father. If you're stupid enough to go die in that trap, that's your business. However, I am not stupid enough to follow you. 
It is tough with a kid. That old man is so stupid. Now, you get the hell down in the cellar. You can be the boss down there. I'm boss up here. You bastards. You know, I won't open this door again. I mean it. Mr. Cooper, with your help, we can... With my help. Let him go, man. His mind is made up. Just let him go. Wait a minute. Judy, come on up here, honey. You're going to let them get hurt, too, huh? It's all right, honey. Go ahead. it up real good. There, there's lots of places we can run to up here. Mr. Cooper, we'd all be a lot better off if all three of us were working together. Hey. Hey, kid. He's wrong, you know. I'm not boxing myself in down there. On the air, day and night. Well, we're safe now. It's boarded up tight. What about Tom and Judy? They want to stay up there, let them. There are two other people upstairs. A man and a girl. We heard the screaming. Yeah, but I didn't know who they were, and I wasn't about to take any unnecessary chances. Of course not, Harry. Is she all right? I don't know what it is. She feels warm. Maybe it's shock. Where'd you get the bandage? Some laundry in a basket. I tore a sheet. Let them stay upstairs. Let them. Too many ways those monsters can get in up there. We'll see who's right. We'll see when they come begging me to let them in down here. That's important, isn't it? What? To be right, everybody else to be wrong. What do you mean by that? Does anyone up there know why we're being attacked? <sighs> Whatever it is, it isn't just happening here. It's some kind of mass murder. It's going on everywhere. The radio said to stay inside. Radio? Radio upstairs. I heard a news bulletin. There's a radio upstairs and you boarded us in down here? I know what I'm doing. What did it say? Nothing. Nothing. They don't know anything yet. There's mass murder everywhere and, and people are supposed to look for a safe place to hide. Take the boards off that door. We are staying down here, Helen. Harry, that radio is at least some kind of communication. If the authorities know what's happening, well, they'll send people for us so they tell us what to do. How are we going to know what's going on if we lock ourselves in this dungeon? We may not enjoy living together, but dying together isn't going to solve anything. Those people aren't our enemies. Mr. Cooper! Mr. Cooper, Ben found a television set upstairs. Let's go up. Tom? Yeah. If Judy would come downstairs for a few minutes, Harry and I could come upstairs. Okay, yeah, right away. Will you do it? Do I have to? Look, honey, nothing's going to get done with them down there and us up here. Do this for me. Okay. Okay, open up.
why don't you go upstairs now? All right, the wait is finally over. Time for the big unveiling. Our B-Movie Banter interview with Sid Haig, brought to you by Jimmy Jams of Winona. Comic books, video games, DVDs, board games, and more. Jimmy Jams has you covered. All right, likely know Sid Haig best for his portrayal of Captain Spaulding from Rob Zombie's House of a Thousand Corpses and The Devil's Rejects, but he's been in the business since the early 60s and has worked for some of the best directors in the game, George Lucas, Roger Corman, Quentin Tarantino, and, of course, Zombie. He's a cool cat and has a strong message for anyone pursuing a dream, whatever that dream may be, and some funny stories to tell <laughs> from the set of the Firefly Flammy, as well as a tale about the strangest request he's ever received from a fan that is sure to bring a smile to your face. Before we unleash this bad boy, anything to add, Derek? I mean, I hope he's not as scary as he is in the movies, because I'm a big chicken. All right, without further delay, our B-Movie Banner interview with Sid Hey, What the... First of all, Sid Haig, thanks for joining us here today. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. All right. First of all, actors, writers, and directors who work primarily in the horror genre seem to be, I don't know if it's more comfortable or appreciative of their fans than others in Hollywood, but they appear to be more at ease and welcoming of interaction with their fans. As someone who travels and partakes in horror conventions like you were just talking about and whatnot, can you elaborate on that a bit or am I way off with that perception? No. It's a, it's a thing of appreciation, okay? Um, I mean, horror film fans are the most loyal, the most, uh, and in a lot of cases, intelligent in terms of what it is that they consider a good horror film. Mm -hmm. uh, and when they come to you with uh, the kind of energy and excitement that they have, it just, you know, it, it makes you want to give back to them. Mm -hmm. You know, I asked this of Kane Hodder last October, and I have to ask you the same question because I have a feeling you may have him beat with the Firefly family fans out there. What is the strangest request you've ever gotten from a fan? <laughs> Can you tell um, us? <laughs> is this a G-rated thing or what? <laughs> if, if there's any colorful language, we can take care of that, but I'm interested to hear the story. Okay, well, I, a fan, um, I was doing a convention and this guy said, uh, I've got a friend of mine on the phone, she can't be here, she's at work or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, just talk to her. And so um, I said, all right. And he said, you know, say that line about, uh, 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 I'd love to bite you in the rear, okay? <laughs> film for five years when Quentin Tarantino contacted you to play a judge in Jackie Brown. What was your reaction to getting a call out of the blue like that after all those years from a guy who was coming off of Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction? Well, um, I was really shocked because, first of all, he called me at home. Mm How -hmm. oh, you got my home phone number, I'll never know. But <laughs> I guess when you're Karen, you know, Tarantino, it's like you're in the CIA. Give me some hey, boom, done. <laughs> six years before you got the part of Captain Spaulding in House of a Thousand Corpses. 
you know, like you just talked about, you declared you didn't want to play any more heavies. And after years and years had passed, did you ever think you'd get such roles like that late in your career? Um, I am driven, okay, or if you pr prefer the term insane, okay? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't quit. I, I don't ever quit, okay, and that's my motto to, to everyone, no matter what it is that you want to do as a profession, if you have a passion for it, you cannot quit, mm -hmm. all right, and you can't have a backup plan because if when things get tough, you will back up, and when you do, your dream will die. So I just keep marching forward. With all the films you've worked with him on, what has Rob Zombie meant to your career? for some incredibly successful filmmakers, Jack Hill, George Lucas, Roger Corman, Quentin Tarantino, Zombie. I know you've said picking a favorite director or project you've worked on is like being asked which of your children is your favorite, but I wonder which of those challenge you the most as an actor? You know, the, the biggest challenge that I had as an actor was the Saturday morning uh, live action show, Jason of Star Command, hmm. Be because we had uh, five weeks to do 15 episodes. Oh. And so it was one giant script. And the way that they were able to accomplish that was that everything that happened in a certain location, let's say the control room, okay? Mm -hmm. Everything that happened in the control room in all 15 scripts were all shot at the same time. But that meant that you had to remember which story you were doing and what was happening before and what was happening after and, and so it was like you were disconnecting and connecting and disconnecting and connecting and it was like it was a, it was crazy it was a, a, a mental madhouse Jeez. but um you know we got through it of course because we were the number one show on the air in that time slot for two years hmm uh, clearly, the Firefly family resonates to millions, but when you think about House of a Thousand Corpses, The Devil's Rejects, what appealed to you with regard to the dynamic of those characters and that family? Well, the thing that appealed to me was the fact that I could have so much fun with it. I mean, uh, you know, as you pointed out, I hadn't worked in years by my own choice. Mm -hmm. When I spoke with uh, Elizabeth Daly about The Devil's Reject, she said that despite the intensity of the film and the subject matter, there was a lot of laughter and fun on that set. Do you have a story you can share with us as an example of the good times that was had while filming that movie? Oh, God, there's just so much that... <laughs> 
<laughs> I was constantly, uh, it became my mission to su surprise Rob, okay? <laughs> because one of the first scenes that I shot was the scene where the guys come in to rob my store. Yeah. And when the guys should stick them up and I gave them the finger to double finger, okay? <laughs> yeah. that wasn't in the script. a little bit more of a long-winded question here but I was just I want to get your thoughts on this I've heard you say that what makes a horror film stand out to you is realism I've often thought that what made Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy so epic was that he took a ridiculous premise like a man dressed as a bat fighting crime but he approached it seriously so it played with dramatic intensity Rob Zombie's Halloween reimaginings aside that typically hasn't been the case in horror slasher franchises like Friday the 13th or Halloween or a nightmare on Elm Street do you think that if someone were to approach a continuing story for one of those big three but took it seriously, we could have a horror epic? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. I mean, if, if you, if, if we hadn't gotten killed off, you could take um, The Devil's Rejects and move that on forever. Mm -hmm. um, and and, the, and the, the thing that was, of course, so crazy about The, the Devil's Rejects was here are these three sociopaths <laughs> just causing havoc every place they went. But by the end of the film, the audience was on our side. Right. Because the cops were worse than we were. Right. Um, and you could turn those three characters into anti-heroes easily. All right, so what's on the horizon for you? Conventions, films, you know, when and where will we see Sid Haig pop up again? <laughs> I did a music video for Twisted. All right. Uh, and uh, it was at the end of the video, uh, a pop-up came up and said to be continued. So I'm <laughs> doing another part of that same video um, in November. I have a film called Fire on the Hog, which is getting prepped for release. Uh, and the thing that was so cool about that was that as we were shooting, um, I recognized the fact that the, the crew was young, but they were energetic and they wanted to do a really great job and they were enthusiastic. Uh, they were young film students and theater arts majors. And the problem was they really didn't know what their job was. And mm. so I went to the executive producer and Kevin Lockhart and I said, uh, you know, Kevin, you need to get a producer in here. It's got some organizational skills to teach these people what it is they need to, to do. Mm -hmm. And he said, he looked at me straight in the eye and said, well, will you do it? <laughs> and I said, well, you have my agent's phone number. So he called and the next day I was the producer, <laughs> one of the producers. Uh, and I had a massive, um, like two and a half hour meeting with all the department heads, told everybody what it was that they had to do, uh, how to do it, uh, how to make a plot uh, that was sensible, that would carry them through the film. Mm. Uh, and if they got into trouble and needed some help, who they should go to, um, because there was a lot of duplication of effort stuff like that and, and things always get screwed up when that happens mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the next day it was like we had a new crew because they had the desire to do a good job and now they had the, the, the uh, uh, knowledge of how to make that happen and, and they did and they made it happen hmm. that's very cool well hey I really appreciate you taking some time to talk to me today I hope you're able to get some rest after the convention and uh, you take care all right, thanks.
Don't be afraid of me. I'm Helen Cooper, Harry's wife. This place is ridiculous. Look at this. There's a million weak spots up here. Give me one of those. Her brother was killed. And they talk about these windows. I can't see a damn thing. There could be 15 million of those things out there. That's how much good these windows are. Why don't you do something to help somebody? Here I have it. Drag a couple of those chairs together. There's a socket over here. Now you better watch this and try to understand what's going on. I don't want anyone's life on my hands. Is there anything I can do to you? I don't want to hear any more from you, mister. If you stay up here, you take orders from me. And that includes leaving the girl alone. It's on. It's on. There's no sound. Play with the rabbit ears. It reports, incredible as they seem, are not the results of mass hysteria. Mass they hysteria. What do they think we're imagining all this? Shut up. In all parts of the country. The wave of murder which is sweeping the eastern third of the nation is being committed by creatures who feast upon the flesh of their victims. First eyewitness accounts of this grisly development came from people who were understandably frightened and almost incoherent. Officials and newsmen at first discounted there was eyewitness descriptions as being beyond belief. However, the reports persisted. The medical examinations of some of the victims bore out the fact that they had been partially devoured. I think we have some late word of just arriving, and I'll interrupt to bring this to you. This is the latest disclosure in a report from National Civil Defense Headquarters in Washington. It has been established that persons who have recently died have been returning to life and committing acts of murder. A widespread investigation of reports from funeral homes, morgues, and hospitals has concluded that the unburied dead are coming back to life and seeking human victims. It's hard for us here to believe what we're reporting to you, but it does seem to be a fact. When this emergency first began, radio and television was advising people to stay inside, behind locked doors for safety. Well, that situation has now changed. and We're able to report a definite course of action for you. Civil defense machinery has been organized to provide rescue stations with food, shelter, medical treatment, and protection by armed National Guardsmen. Stay tuned to the broadcasting stations in your local area for this list of rescue stations. This list will be repeated throughout our news coverage. Look for the name of the rescue station nearest you and make your way to that location as soon as possible. So we have that truck. We can get some gas, we can get out of here. There's a pump out by the shed. I know that's why I pulled in here, but it's locked. Emergency meeting called this afternoon by the president. Since convening, this conference of the presidential cabinet, the FBI, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the CIA, has not produced any public information. Why are space experts being consulted about an Earth-bound emergency? So far, all the betting on the answer to that question centers on the recent Explorer satellite shot to Venus. That satellite, you'll recall, started back to Earth, but never got here. That's the space vehicle which orbited Venus and then was purposely destroyed by NASA when scientists discovered it was carrying a mysterious high-level radiation with it. Could that radiation be somehow responsible for the wholesale murders we're now suffering? Newsman Don Quinn in Washington has posed those questions. It's obvious our best move is to try to get out of here. How are you going to get over to that pump? Look! Uh, you're coming from a meeting regarding the explosion of the Venus probe, is that right? Uh, yes, yes, that was the uh, subject of the meeting. You feel there is a connection between this and the there's phenomenon? A, there's a definite connection, a definite connection. In well, other no. words, you feel that the radiation on the Venus probe is enough to call these, cause these mutations? There was a very high degree of radiation. Well, just a minute. Uh, uh, I'm not sure that that's certain at all. I don't but think that has been a uh, explanation that we have at this time. In other words, it is the military's viewpoint that the radiation is not the cause of the mutation. 
I can't speak for the entire military at this time, gentlemen. This seems to I be... I must disagree with these gentlemen presently until we, uh, until this is irrefutably proved. Uh, everything is uh, being done that can be done. We'll have to hurry for our next meeting. Uh, uh, and Professor, you feel that there is a definite connection between... A definite the... connection as far uh, as Dr. Keller and myself. Doctor, please. I, I thought we decided that is not proved yet. But, uh, was, it, when, was the satellite... When the satellite was exploded... An unusual amount of radiation enough to cause mutation under certain circumstances. Could have uh, happened yeah, to have a bearing on it. It does seem to have a bearing. Yes. Will, will, there be a, will there be a reply for, this, for the... Later. Yes. There will be a reply. Yes. Later this afternoon. There will be a, there will be a report this afternoon. Perhaps there will be yes. a report. Yes. A, a more Later. Full report. Will you close the window? We are doing everything possible to solve the problem. Some further explanation of this. We've heard all we need to know. We have to try to get out of here. He said the rescue stations have doctors and medical supplies. If we could get Karen there, we could get help for her. Elmo is one of the world's foremost authorities on space science and technology. Willard. I saw a sign that said Willard. It's only about 17 miles from here. You know this area. You from around here? Judy and I are both from around here. We were on our way up to the lake to go swimming. And Judy had a radio, and we heard the first reports about this. So we knew the old house was here, and we came in and found the lady upstairs dead. Then these other people came. We went down into the basement and put a bar across the door, and it is pretty strong. How could we possibly get away from here? We've got a sick child, two Dr. women, one woman out of her head, three men, and the place is surrounded with these things. Dr. Neal for NASA. Dr. Grimes, your entire staff, I know, has been working very hard to find some solution to these things that are happening. Do you have any answers at this time? Yes, we have some answers. Uh, but first, let me stress the importance of seeking medical attention for anyone who's been injured in any way. We don't know yet uh, what complications might result from such injuries. How bad has your kid been hurt? Good advice, Doctor. Now, how about the basic um, problem with patients? Well, Look, you go down there and tell... You know, Judy? Uh, yeah, you tell Judy to come up here and you stay with the kid, all right? In the cold room at the university, uh, we had a cadaver, a cadaver from uh, which all four limbs had been amputated. Sometime early this morning, it opened its eyes and began to move its trunk. It was dead, but it opened its eyes and tried to move. They want you upstairs. Did she ask for me? She had to do anything. I don't understand. Baby. It's Mommy. I heard. I'll come back down as soon as I find out what they want. Thank you, Judy. The body should be disposed of at once, preferably by cremation. Well, how long after death, then, does the body become reactivated? It's only a matter of minutes. Minutes? Well, that doesn't give people time to make any arrangements. Oh, you're right. It doesn't give them time to make funeral arrangements. The bodies must be carried to the street and, and, and burned. Uh, they must be burned immediately. Soak them with gasoline and burn them. The bereaved will have to forego the dubious comforts that a funeral service will give. Uh, they're just dead flesh and dangerous. I see. Judy, I need you to find some beds, spreads, or sheets to tear up into small strips, okay? Is there a fruit cellar here? Yes. We need some bottles or jars to make Molotov cocktails to hold them up while we try to escape. Hey, there's a big can of kerosene down there. I'll see what I can find. I'll look for the bottles. There's a big key ring down there. There may be a key to the gas pump on it. I'll check. We can toss the cocktails from a window upstairs. Meantime, a couple of us can go out and try to get the gas and come back for the rest of the people. But that'll leave a door open someplace. Yeah, that's right. It better be this door. It's closer to the truck. Before we go out, we'll put some supplies behind the cellar door. While we're gone, the rest of you can hold up in there. I found some fruit jars in the cellar. And there's a key on here that's labeled for the gas pump out back. I'm not really that used to the truck. I found it abandoned. I can handle the truck, no sweat. You're it, then. You and I'll go. We'll put whatever lumber we find behind the cellar door. You can go upstairs and toss the cocktails from a window. Tom, you and I will have to unboard this door. After you toss the cocktails, you hustle back down here and lock this door. 
It's no good to board it up because we'll have to get back in quickly. After we get the gas and get back into the house, then we'll worry about getting everybody into the truck. Now let's move it. Except for the rescue station, which has been set up. Indications are that before this emergency is over, we'll need many, many more such rescue stations. You always have a smile for me. How can you smile like that all the time? How many do you have done? Come on, honey, we gotta move. Tom, are you sure about the phone? The phone is dead out. All you get is a recorded message. If I could only call the folks, they're going to be so worried about us. Everything will be all right. As soon as we get to Willard, we'll call them. They might even be there. I know. Tom. Mm. Are you sure we're doing the right thing, Tom? What, about getting out of here? Yeah. Well, the television said that's the right thing to do. We've got to get to a rescue station. I don't know. Come on, honey, you're starting to sound like Mr. Cooper now. But why do you have to go out there? Look, I know how to handle that truck, and I can handle the pump. Ben doesn't know anything about that stuff. But we're safe in here. For how long, honey? We're safe now. But there's going to be more and more of those things. I know. I know all that. Hey, listen. Remember when we had the big flood? Remember how difficult it was for us to convince you that it was right to leave? Remember? Remember we had to go to Willard then? This isn't a passing thing, honey. It, it's not like just a wind passing through. We've got to do something, and fast. I just don't want you to go out there, that's all. Hey, Smiley. Where's that big smile for me? Boy, you just sure no use at all, are you? We've got work to do, honey. And you, you. We have to go downstairs now, Barbara. She's right. You have to go downstairs now, just for a little while, until we get back. Then we can all leave. Oh, I'd like to leave. Yes.
Tommy, come on.
isn't it three o'clock yet? There's supposed to be another broadcast at three o'clock. Ten minutes. Oh, only ten more minutes? We don't have very long to wait. We can leave. Well, we'd better leave soon. It's ten minutes to three. You know anything about this area at all? I mean, is Willard the nearest town? I don't know. We were... just trying to get to a motel before dark. You say those things turned your car over. You think we can get it back on its wheels and drive it? Where is it? Seems like it was pretty far away. Seems like we ran. Forget it. It's at least a mile. Johnny has the keys. You're gonna carry that child a mile? Through that army of things out there? I can carry the kid. What's wrong with her? How'd she get hurt? One of those things grabbed her. Bit her on the arm. What's wrong? Who knows what kind of disease those things carry? Is she conscious? Barely. She can't walk. She's too weak. Well, one of us could try to get to the car. You're gonna turn it over by yourself? You can't start the car. Johnny has the keys. You have a car? Where? Where is it? You won't be able to start it. Yeah, yeah, I know. But where is it? Good Lord. Being monitored closely by scientists at all the radiation detection stations. At this hour, they report the level of the mysterious radiation continues to increase steadily. So long as this situation remains, government spokesmen warn that dead bodies will continue to be transformed into the flesh-eating ghouls. All persons who die during this crisis, from whatever cause, will come back to life to seek human victims unless their bodies are first disposed of by cremation. Our news cameras have just returned from covering such a search and destroy operation against the ghouls. This one conducted by Sheriff Conan McClellan in Butler County, Pennsylvania. So now let's go to that film report. All law enforcement agencies and the military have been organized to search out and destroy the marauding ghouls. The Survival Command Center at the Pentagon has disclosed that a ghoul can be killed by a shot in the head or a heavy blow to the skull. Officials are quoted as explaining that since the brain of a ghoul has been activated by the radiation, the plan is kill the brain and you kill the ghoul. What do you think from the supply wagon, Gus? Uh, no, we're all right. Hey, Gas, put that thing all the way in the fire. We don't want it getting up again. Chief, Chief McClellan, how's everything going? Oh, things aren't going too bad. Men are taking it pretty good. You want to get on the other side of the road over there? Chief, do you think we'll be able to defeat these things? Well, we killed 19 of them today right in this area. Those last three we caught trying to claw their way into an abandoned shed. They must have thought somebody was in there. There wasn't, though. We heard them making all kind of noise. We came over and beat them off, blasted them down. Yeah, okay. Chief, uh, if I were surrounded by six or eight of these things, would I stand a chance with them? Well, there's no problem. If you had a gun, shoot them in the head. That's a sure way to kill them. If you don't, get yourself a club or a torch. Beat them or burn them. They go up pretty easy. Well, Chief McClellan, how long do you think it will take you until you get the situation under control? Well, that's pretty hard to say. We don't know how many of them there are. We know when we find them, we can kill them. Are they slow moving, Chief? Yeah, they're dead. They're all messed up. Well, uh, in time, would you say you ought to be able to wrap this up in 24 hours? Well, we don't really know. We know we'll be into it most of the night, probably into the early morning. We're working our way toward Willard, and we'll team up with the National Guard over there, and then we'll be able to give a more definite view. Thank you very much, Chief McClellan. This is Bill Cardill, WIC TV 11 News. Thank you, Bill, for that report. 
Official spokesmen decline to speculate just how long it may take to kill off all the flesh eaters, so long as the heavy rate... Is the fuse box in the cellar? I don't know. I... It isn't the fuse. The power lines are down. Helen, I have to get that gun. Haven't you had enough? What? Two people are dead already on account of that guy. Take a look out that window, click it.
You want to get about four or five men and a couple dogs? There's a house over here behind those trees. We want to go check it out. Right. You okay. here, Bill. Yeah, Chief. We're going to stay with it till we meet up with the National Guard. Where'd you get the coffee? One well, of the volunteers. You're doing all the work. You take it. Thank you. We should be wrapped up here about three or four more hours. We'll probably get into Willard then. I guess you can go over there and meet the National Guard. Nick, you and the rest of these men want to come with me? Well, Bill, I'm going to check in the office see what's happening. All right, Steve. Tell them we're going to stay with it, and uh, everything appears to be under control. <laughs> You, drag that out of here and throw it on the fire. Nothing down here? All right, go ahead down and give him a hand. Let's go check out the house. Man. There's something there. I heard a noise. All right, Vince, hit him in the head, right between the eyes. Good shot. Okay, he's dead. Let's go get him. That's another one for the fire.
All right, that was our second annual Halloween presentation of Night of the Living Dead. It never gets old, and we're going to keep bringing it back year after year unless John Carpenter gives us the nod on Halloween, in which case Myers trumps Romero. That said, Derek, what was your favorite scene from the classic? I think my favorite scene is in the movie is near the end when they, uh, they make a break for it to uh, drive to the gas pump. And the movie quickly turns into the beginning of Zoolander, <laughs> where the, the lovely couple goes up in flames because the husband, uh, he can't turn, can't turn down a gas fight with the, uh, the zombies instead of filling up the tank. I mean, worst honeymoon ever. <laughs> yeah, the keys weren't all that important if all you really wanted to do was blast the damn thing. But, uh, you know, we haven't decided what our next film will be, but we're leaning toward a sci-fi flick called Slipstream with Mark Hamill, Bill Paxton, and Ben Kingsley. And our likely B-movie banter guest would be the wholly awesome Ken Foray from both the original and remade Dawn of the Dead, not to mention Rob Zombie's Halloween and The Devil's Rejects. So good times to be had there. In any event, that's going to do it for us for this All Hallows' Eve edition of B-movie. Thanks for joining us, and be sure to not only have a happy but safe Halloween, for the Colonel Derek Hart, I'm Landon Evanson, reminding you that when the zombie apocalypse happens, preppers are your friends. So don't mock, be polite, because it could mean your ass. Happy Halloween.